since very earliest times, men have always wondered what lay beyond the horizon. Ladies and gentlemen, Banal of America Audio, with your host, Tim Banal. Hello out there, my friends. This is Tim Banal of BanalofAmerica.com, with another edition of BOA Audio Season 3. It is March 9th, 2008, and this week we have an awesome episode on tap for you. We're going to be calling all the way to Northern Ireland to talk with Dr. Bob Curran, author of the amazing book, Lost Lands, Forgotten Realms, Sunken Continents, Vanished Cities, and the Kingdoms that History Misplaced. And we're going to be talking about a ton of famous, infamous, and forgotten esoteric landmarks. Chances are you've heard of some of them. Chances are you haven't heard of other ones. Maybe you only know a little bit about some of them. Let me run down the list of locations we're going to be talking about just to give you a little sampling of what you're going to hear tonight. The Other World, Green Island, Atlantis, Lemuria, Davy Jones' Locker and the Flying Dutchman, Shangri-La, Shambhala, The Kingdom of Prester John, El Dorado, The Kingdom of Prince Madoc, The Fountain of Youth, The Green Children, The Library of Alexandria, and, of course, tons and tons more. Plus, we're going to talk about some of the key people in some of these stories, like Madame Blavatsky, and the strange Nazi connection to some of these historic esoteric landmarks that may or may not have existed. I had the pleasure of already listening to the interview a couple days ago, and it is a captivating conversation. Dr. Bob Karn, I think you're going to really like his style and his delivery. He is a storyteller, my friends. So sit back, relax, put your feet up, and enjoy this interview, because it's going to be a fun one to listen to, trust me. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Dr. Bob Curran, let me give you a little bit of background on him. Psychologist and historian Dr. Bob Curran has traveled the world in the study of mythology and folklore, which he has also extensively written and lectured about. He is the author of Vampires, Encyclopedia of the Undead, Celtic Lore and Legend, and Walking with the Green Men. He lives in Northern Ireland with his wife and family. He doesn't have a website, but we've got his email address here. He can be reached at Dr. Bob Curran, all one word, at yahoo.co.uk. Without any further ado, let's rock and roll. This interview was recorded on March 4, 2008. Dr. Bob Curran, talking about Lost Lands, Forgotten Realms, on BOA Audio Season 3. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a very special edition of Been All of America Audio. Uh, I know I say that at week in and week out, it seems, but this time I really mean it was an ultra-special edition. Uh, we're, we're jumping across the Atlantic once again for another fascinating interview. We're going all the way to Northern Ireland. Our guest is Dr. Bob Curran, and what we're going to be talking about today is his outstanding book, Lost Lands, Forgotten Realms. I finished this last night. I cannot put this book over enough. It is fantastic. I'd say it's a must-read for any student of the esoteric. Uh, there's so many places that people who study the esoteric have heard about, Atlantis, Lemuria, uh, Shambhala, Shangri-La. That's just like three of the many that are profiled in the book. But we've heard of them so many times, and a lot of people just don't know the background of them. And this book really digs into them and does just a fantastic job of educating you as to uh, the origins of these lost lands, forgotten realms. And, you know, were they real? Could they have existed somewhere? What do we know about these places? Dr. Bob Karn, as I said, has done an outstanding job looking into this mystery, into these series of mysteries. And he's here now on the program, direct from Northern Ireland, to discuss the book and to uh, have a little conversation with us. So welcome to the show, Dr. Bob Karn. Hello, Tim, and how can I follow that build-up? 
<laughs> well, I'm telling you, Dr. Bob, uh, you know, I haven't raved about a book like this uh, in a few months now, but I really, really enjoyed it. Like I said, I can't put it over enough. It's fantastic, and I hope uh, people go well, out and check it out. Much. Before we dive into Lost Lands, Forgotten Realms, let's find out a little bit about you. Who is Dr. Bob Curran? You know, what's your bio, your background? How did you gravitate towards these mysteries that are the esoteric? Well, Tim, I grew up in a very remote area of Northern Ireland, and their storytelling was a great uh, pastime. Uh, if you could see me, Tim, you would know by the grey in my beard that I'm not a young a spring chicken, if, if I can say that. Uh, and a lot of our amusement was listening to stories, and I got uh, involved in stories, particularly people who had been to other places. Uh, as I say, the area I grew up in was quite remote, and people uh, who travel, let's say, to England or even America were considered to have traveled. So they came back and they told stories, and I suppose a lot of the stories stuck with me, and I wanted to know uh, about places that were far away and things that were happening and things that were mysterious and things uh, like that. So... That was actually how I got into it. Uh, I became interested in history. I teach history, and I teach a bit of uh, psychology. And so the two of them have come together, I think, in this book. So uh, maybe that's what makes it so interesting. There's lost lands in, in us all, whether they be out there or whether they be within us. Exactly. Yeah, you make that great point in the book. They may not be locations, but they say, they may say more about the sociology of people than actually Absolutely. what the locations are all about. Mm -hmm. I guess just talk about what Lost Lands Forgotten Realms looks into. Like we've said, mythical places and that kind of thing, but, but sort of give a thumbnail preview before we uh, jump into some of the specific locations. Okay, since, uh, since very earliest times, men have always wondered what lay beyond the horizon. Now, people did travel a, lo a long period. And I, I said that uh, at the start, people which I knew, came, uh, whom I knew, came back from various other parts of the world. And they began to talk about wonderful things. And gradually, people began to look at um, what might be out there, what sort of people uh, they might be, and what sort of marvels were there. Because some of the people who came back to him uh, told them uh, about things which they had no concept of. Mm -hmm. Now, some of them may have been true, some of them may have been false. Um, there were stories, for instance, uh, old travelers' tales of people who slept on their ears. Uh, they, they lay down on one ear and put the other ear over uh, them like a blanket. <laughs> there, were, there, there were stories of, uh, and some of you, uh, your listeners may know about this from Greek mythology, there were stories of great giants with one eye, and uh, there were things about um, men who were half man, half horse. So, all these wonderful tales began to, and gradually began to coalesce into a series of, of stories about places which might or might not exist. Uh, some of them represented bits and pieces of uh, history. Some of them simply uh, were fragments of aspirations and longings and imaginings of the people. So. The Lost Lands gradually filtered into the cultural pattern and cultural myth of uh, society and uh, has come down to us places like Atlantis, places like El Dorado, places like Shangri-La. And if you travel around here, Tim, you will see many houses with Shangri-La up on them. So it must have slipped into the culture somehow. Yeah, I sort of cherry-picked some of the areas here that are covered in the book and, and had some questions about them. Okay. And, uh, and said, you know, like I said, we're, we're going to scratch the surface here in this interview. There's tons. How many, would you say, actual areas are profiled in the book? Would oh, I, I literally don't know, Tim. I just, <laughs> I just kept going. And uh, between you and me, Tim, I had to cut out a whole number of lands, so there might even be a second book. Oh, wow, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. And like you say in the book, uh, each you know each area that you discuss, each each lost land that you discuss, could be a book in and of itself. So like uh, like I said, we're just going to scratch Absolutely. the surface here. Yeah. Well, let's dive in on the other world. 
which is okay. one of the first places profiled in the book. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about The Other World. The Other World, uh, from my own point of view, was a realm in Celtic mythology. When people died or when they disappeared, they may have went to the other world. Now, uh, I was telling you that I can um, go out and see. I'm not too far from the sea. So you can go out and you can look at the massive cloud formations uh, off a little place down the road called Port Stewart. And the, the clouds gather together into shapes of mountains and, uh, and things like that. Uh, and uh, I suppose for many people, uh, and maybe uh, in Massachusetts, you have uh, on a beautiful day looked up at the clouds and you can see all sorts of ships. You can see castles, you can see buildings, you can see th uh, things like that. And I suppose that, that conjured up to people something of a mysterious other world. Now, that uh, fed into their belief, and they believed that there was a, another land just beyond human comprehension, which, was, uh, which they could see, but which they couldn't touch, except they were extra special. Now, it meant that perhaps poets or great men went to these other places. And uh, this was the world uh, uh, of the fairy. This was the world, perhaps, even of the dead. It was a paradisical land. It was beautiful in some respects. In other respects, people who went there did not age. So if you returned, as I think I mentioned, uh, Oshim did, a uh, hundred years have passed even in a day. So everybody you know is dead and um, the, the world has changed. So the other world lay just beyond human comprehension. We could see it, perhaps on the clouds on the horizon or the clouds over the fields, but we could never get to it except we were somebody special. Maybe Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton will get there. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the uh, parts of the book that you talk about in the other world section is uh, that there were some weird stories from the 1800s uh, where people would see these cloud formations and really uh, it would create quite a frenzy in the town. They would believe that there was um, a town across there. Absolutely. I mentioned Port Stewart to you there, which is just about four or five miles down the road from where I'm talking to you. In the 1800s, um, there was actually a mirage which appeared. Now, a mirage is something which appears and is really not there, and travelers see them in the desert, uh, and things created by various atmospheric conditions. But uh, some of it appeared on, uh, even off the coast of Scotland, off the coast of Southern Ireland, and uh, men actually tried to row out to get them. They could see castles, they could see houses, they could actually see people walking on the roads. Now, perhaps that was a reflection of something somewhere else. But that be, uh, began to develop a sort of mystical quality. And whenever you rode out to it, and it disappeared, then it became even more mystical because you had actually seen it, but it wasn't there. So it could be something from another zone, another time, uh, and it may well have been from another place on, uh, on the Earth. A point I wanted to make here uh, that, that's in the book, uh, in the section here on High Brazil, is that it appeared on a lot of maps that, that some of these places would be on maps and stuff like that during the time period, and uh, even though from what we can ascertain, they're, they're not out there in the ocean or something like that. Absolutely. Um, remember that many of the cartographers, those people who made the maps, had never uh, traveled outside uh, the town in which they lived and relied on the stories of um, sailors coming back as to uh, their impression of what the world was like. So if the sailor said, well, you know, there was an island out there, we, we thought we glimpsed an island um, on just along the horizon, the map maker would say, well, this man has been out there, he has seen this thing, I haven't, so I'm going to put it in my map. And so uh, a number of lands began to appear. Now, there was a very famous one which had no basis at all in geography, which is literally not far from me. And uh, on old maps of Rathlin Island, which lie off the north, co north coast of Ireland, there is an island marked called the Green Island. And that came from an old folk tale which said that fairies lived there. And the island appeared only once uh, every seven years. 
and that uh, people travel to it to actually work for the fairies. That meant to bring in their harvests and to gather their potatoes because it was assumed that the fairies lived exactly the same way that we did. Mm -hmm. There there are stories, in fact, uh, I've I've just been collecting a story about a woman who claims to have went and lived on the fairy island. So uh, with all these stories floating about, those who made the maps decided that they would put it on just off the coast of Rathland. So they have it marked on some very old maps as the Green Island or the Shamrock Island. Once again, and you mentioned it, High Brazil. Uh, They assumed that High Brazil lay somewhere out in the North Atlantic because uh, people had uh, seen something, perhaps the back of a whale, perhaps uh, a reef which was then submerged, or something like that. And it became such a, a... central myth, that some Spanish sailors who believed it, or Portuguese sailors, I should say, who believed it, actually named the country of Brazil after it, because they thought they had landed there. (laughs) (laughs) There you are. One person who shows up a lot in the book, uh, who seems like she's pretty responsible for repopularizing, uh, if that's even a word, uh, (laughs) many of these... What is, yeah, you're (laughs) right. Okay, good. Uh, Many of these locations is uh, Madame Blavatsky. I didn't realize she had such an integral role in bringing these areas back into the uh, popular culture. Uh, Helena Petrovna uh, Blavatsky was a great esoteric lady. Now, depending on how you you view her, some people think she was a great uh, thinker. Uh, Some people think she was a great fraud. She drew on many of the myths which were floating about at the time. Now, Madame Blavatsky believed that she was in contact with a series of great masters uh, who lived somewhere in Tibet and who, uh, in some cases, communicated uh, to her by a cuckoo clock sending her messages. Now, they gave her a sort of potted history of the world, which had talked about great continents like Atlantis or Lemuria or Mu, in which there had been various ages of creatures who had lived in this world, uh, whether or not they were the forerunners of man or whether they were something uh, else. And uh, she wrote extensively on uh, on this and drew up on many of the old myths in order to support her uh, views of theosophy about the age of the world and to give greater credence to her views of the occult and how people could get various powers and know various things and gain various knowledge and, and things like that. So Uh, She wrote extensively, and she had a great influence because uh, she was writing at a time when the world was being explored and new things were being found out. She was writing at the beginning of the uh, the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s. And this was a period of of expansion when people were beginning to expand into new areas of the world. And so she was part of that and had a tremendous influence on that uh, period of time, and has, uh, some of her writings has co- have come down to us. Talk a little bit about Atlantis, because that's sort of the big daddy of lost lands and forgotten realms. It seems to be the biggest, uh, the most popular, or the most famous uh, lost lost places it is, and it's a strange sort of history in the sense that we only, the original source is just Plato, and, a, and you know, passing through the story right. they wrote, and uh, other than that, you know, we don't know too much about whether it was even in the history or not, so it's a, it's a fascinating uh, story. Well, Tim, that represents what I would term uh, the historical and the imaginary or the uh, hopes and uh, and aspirations, the aspirational. Because Atlantis, uh, and I think this is why the myth or the story of Atlantis has endured for so long, because it represents, to some extent, it represents our hopes and ideals. Whenever I was growing up, Atlantis was somewhere beneath the North Atlantic, so it was said, and it had once been a great civilization. Um, 
I, I remember reading old books which suggested that they had cars and they had airplanes and uh, and all sorts of things. That was a tremendous futuristic civilization, and it was a benign civilization. Now, what uh, the early writers tell us about Atlantis was that it was nothing of the sort. It, it lay beyond the pillars of Hercules, uh, according to uh, some people. Uh, some writers from the Mediterranean region, and that was actually outside their sphere of influence. So it was uh, practically in an, in an unknown part of the uh, of the earth, and it was very barbaric. It was a slave society. The people there were very militaristic and incredibly warlike, and they raided around the Mediterranean, and they were destroyed by a great cataclysm. Now, that may be part of an old folk memory, which comes from the Minoan civilization, which actually existed within the Mediterranean area. The only part of that civilization which remains, because the civilization was probably destroyed by a massive volcanic eruption, mm -hmm. the only part of, uh, of that civilization which remains is the island of Santorini in the Greek archipelago, and that is black and volcanic and is probably, roughly, uh, if Atlantis did exist, where it uh, would have existed. Now, it was probably not called Atlantis. It was probably part of, the Mano uh, of a very early Minoan civilization, which we know existed, because we have pots and shards from that. But that exploded a long, long time ago. Let's talk a little bit about the strange sort of evolution of the story of Lemuria, because I found it interesting that it sort of started out in a very uh, benign way, a theory of how the species of lemurs may have been dispersed, and then it turned into this fantastical tale of a lost civilization and everything else. That's a strange sort of evolution. It kind of tells you a lot about people in and of itself. Well, once again, that is a combination, I would argue, of what actually happened with with the evolutionary and the spread, as you say, of the lemurs and land bridges. And it combines with part of the age-old query about where people came from and where men and races and uh, creatures began to evolve or where did they actually come from. So you have a sort of geological thing mixing with people beginning to speculate on how men were dispersed or creatures were dispersed over the earth. So you have the geological, because the earth looked very different back in various periods of time than it does now, and uh, possibly uh, creatures moved from one part to the other. And you have then the imagination you have the explanation. People say, well, how did this race get from A to B? Were they a seafaring people? No, they weren't. So there must have been some sort of great continent there. And uh, that begins to uh, give us an explanation, which we can deal with. Then bits and pieces of the imagination is added to it. For instance, there must be, have been at one stage a great civilization. Uh, the people came, let's say, to America. The people live under Mount Shasta, and they are benign and wonderful beings because they could travel about all over the place. So you're getting human imagination, seeking to explain how geology and geography works, and adding bits and pieces to it. So suddenly great continents begin to emerge, which have now sank beneath the sea. And quite possibly there were continents, but they may not have been as we imagine them. Yeah, it's really fascinating to think about the way people are and stuff like that and the way Absolutely. society is. Absolutely. And I was talking to a gentleman not so long ago and we were talking about the Red Indians. And he said, well, he says, you know, he says, the Red Indians are possibly descendants of the Chinese. And so, once again, uh, he was talking about a myth of a continent somewhere which had given both the Chinese and the Red Indians to the world. <laughs> there you are. Yeah. You, you pay your money, you take your choice. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Speaking of sinking beneath the sea, let's talk about a popular 
uh, location here, the oh, popular yeah. Lost Land Forgotten Realm uh, that's been really popular in the last few years, and that's the Davy Jones locker story and how that ties into the Flying Dutchman. You know, if someone's seen Pirates of the Caribbean, it's, it's not like that at all. <laughs> it hasn't, because Davy Jones sort of emerges as this sort of tentacle H.P. Lovecraft sort of figure. No, uh, actually, the, uh, we believe that there was a, uh, a gentleman called David Jones, but he was not the Davy Jones of the locker. David Jones, as far as I can, uh, was um, a pirate, possibly of Welsh origin, who operated out of Port Royal, Jamaica, uh, before it was destroyed by an earthquake. And he operated there in about 1630, 1631. But he was of literally no consequence uh, in piratical terms. Uh, the... Uh, Notion of Davy Jones' locker, which they say may uh, have come from a variety of sources. Firstly, the name Jones, and the name Jones is Welsh, but some have argued that it was a derivation of Jonah. Jonah, as you may remember, was uh, the prophet whom God sent to Nineveh uh, to tell them to behave themselves and mend their ways. And Jonah refused to go and set out on a ship for another port and was swallowed by the great whale and vomited up on the beach. So Jonah became a, a figure that was bad luck on boats. Now, the Devi, they argue, may be a word for the devil, or it may come from the West Indian Duppy, which is a ghost or a specter uh, in Caribbean and Creole mythology. So it might, uh, that, uh, how, how the name has come about, there may also have been a connection to uh, a gentleman who actually did keep a locker. Now, uh, here, as I'm sure there was in the, the United States, there was a series and various ships of impressment. Now, this meant that captains of ships who pulled into ports and found their crews, uh, they didn't have enough crew to continue with their voyage, particularly naval ships, were allowed to impress men from the local area to serve on the ship wherever it was going. And now, um, many young men didn't want to go and, and leave their homes and their wives and whatever. So there was a series of landlords who kept lockers. Now, whenever young men got very, very drunk, they were tossed into these lockers and waited for what were called press gangs, the impressment gangs, who then carried them out and threw them into the uh, into the boats. Whenever you sobered up, you found you were on a ship bound for the West Indies. Uh, so there was a, a, a number of notorious landlords, one of whom was supposed to be Davy Jones, who kept a beer locker mm -hmm. uh, into which he threw these men. There was also uh, an old song at the time, which was called When Jones's Ale Was New, and it talks about men coming to, uh, uh, strangely enough, there's not a sailor among them. There were four jovial fellows. Uh, one was a soldier, one was a dyer, one was a tinker, and one was a mason. But the name Jones stuck because it is possible that this song was what was called a capstan song. Whenever the crews were winching up the uh, anchor, they sang a song. Or uh, another thing which they did was haul a bowline, which was um, pulling a rope to change the, the direction of a sail on a sailing ship. And they sang these songs, and the name Jones may well have uh, have stuck. But he could be a Creole ghost. He could be an English gentleman, because there was a gentleman in Bristol, supposedly called David Jones, who kept a nail locker into which he threw drunk men in order to wait for the impressment gangs. Or he could have been a figure in a song, which was sung on various sailing ships. The Flying Dutchman, that was a real uh, person, correct? That was a gentleman, and I have to watch how I say this on radio. Uh, he was called Bernard Falk. <laughs> it's okay, we're on the internet. <laughs> he, was called, he was called Bernard Falk. Now, this was in, in the days of the great tea clippers, in which uh, tea was brought from the plantations of the West Indies to places like Bristol and Portsmouth. Uh, to be sold, mm -hmm. and uh, as well as that from uh, the New World, uh, from America. And uh, these ships were owned by various companies, 
who competed with each other in order to get their goods to the ports first so that they could have the, the best sales. And uh, there were races between the tea clippers. And Falk was uh, allegedly born in, um, in Rotterdam, sorry, and was the captain of one of these ships and was a very fast, he made very, very good time because they had to sail around a place called the Cape of Good Hope at the foot of Africa, which was very stormy and which held the ships up. But uh, Fox seemed to be able to get through this. And he became known as Der Flieglander Hollander, the Flying Dutchman, because he uh, he was of Dutch nationality. And he was supposedly able to get around the Cape of Good Hope in record time, which led to the notion that he was using some sort of, sort of supernatural powers. And so the Flying Dutchman became a, a sort of a nickname for him. And the story was that he had sold his soul to the devil and uh, that uh, he could get around the Cape of Good Hope and be in Bristol, Portsmouth or whatever, before any of his rivals. That led to the notion that whenever he died, he was doomed to sail the seas forever, particularly the seas off the Cape of Good Hope. Many people claim to have seen him or his ship. The name then became transferred actually to the ship. Fox ship is never given a name. And uh, it is assumed that he sailed about two or three ships. But the Flying Dutchman became equated with the ship itself. And uh, later on, it became associated with Davy Jones. And that's why you find uh, in the film Pirates of the Caribbean, Davy Jones is captain of the Flying Dutchman. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a it's quite a journey there. For, <laughs> for, <laughs> it is. It is. I learned actually a lot of things here from the book, but one mystery that was cleared up for me: Shambhala and Shangri-La. Those are actually the same place. They are. Uh, I told you earlier that whenever you go around here, you'll see a number of uh, houses which are called Shangri-La. Mm -hmm. Now, Shangri-La here in Ireland always ref uh, usually refers to people who have retired and who have bought a house and who are well settled and have settled down into their twilight years and this is where they're living. And Shangri-La was supposedly the place of eternal peace and tranquility, and where everything was almost perfect. Shangri-La was supposed to be a place in the Himalayas. Now, it became very famous in the 1930s, uh, when the film Lost Horizon was released. And it was a, uh, the film, for those who don't know it, was about a plane crash in uh, the Himalayas, and the survivors being rescued by wonderful monkeys and taken to a place of great tranquility and beauty. Uh, there may well have been monasteries um, in the Himalayas to which uh, the lamas or the monks retired. And uh, there actually is a story about monks coming from a hidden valley somewhere up, because Shangri-La was supposed to be a hidden valley, somewhere up in the Himalayas to one of the local kings on the edge of Bhutan in the country of Kaig and making representations to him and then uh, disappearing off again. So there probably were monasteries or retreats or hermitages or so which the monks used. Now, there were probably nothing like great havens of tranquility or, or this has been put into by the sort of 20th century mind. Mm -hmm. Whenever things get too much for us, Tim, I don't know about you, but sometimes I wish there was a place I could escape to. Mm -hmm. uh, well, maybe you suffer the same, but uh, what you can escape to and have a, a nice quiet time and uh, maybe reflect on things and need to think about, like, me time. Yeah. So, uh, so maybe Shangri-La, while it may well have been a historical place, has become equated in our minds with tranquility, with beauty, with peace, and with uh, sort of restorative powers, your reach, a place that you can recharge your batteries. That may be the origin of Shangri-La. Yes, Shambhala, which was sought after by the Nazis, 
yeah. uh, in the 1930s and early 40s well, was uh, in the Himalayas. Now, the Nazis had a very, very different agenda. They weren't looking for a place which um, was full of rest and tranquility. No, they were looking for a place from which the Aryan race may have come. Because there were stories in the mountains, and I touch on some of them, there's places like Hyperborea, the land behind the wind, and, and places like that, which were supposed to be uh, where races, uh, some of the early races came from, and this harks back once again to what we were talking about earlier to Madame Blavatsky. And the Nazis were anxious to find if there was anything which would give credence to Hitler's belief that there was a, a superior race or a master race which had once ruled in the world. And uh, it was thought that perhaps this might be found in the Himalayas or in the edges of Tibet. And certainly in 1939, expeditions were sent from Germany into Tibet to look around for somewhere like Shambhala, from which uh, the Aryan race was said to emerge. Shambhala may well be underground, we're, we're not sure, but they began to look around for uh, evidences of this which would give credence to the Nazi philosophy of the master race. And it was thought that they, uh, they might have found it there. I don't think they found very much. Uh, in fact, I know they, they returned empty-handed. But it once again reflected the, the hopes, the aspirations of the people who were looking for it. And it's just fascinating to think within the last hundred years or so that people were still, you know, mounting these serious expeditions to find these places. It's not Absolutely. Just, yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, another area of significance, really in a historical way, in a political sort of way, and that's the Kingdom of Prester John. I had never heard of this story. Uh, the whole aspect of the letter being sent was fascinating, and then how Christian powers that be tried to assign the Kingdom of Prester John to various people in a way to uh, sort of bolster their standing in the world. Uh, let's talk about the Kingdom of Prester John. The Kingdom of Prester John was a medieval uh, story. It is said that the Byzantine uh, Emperor Manuel uh, I received, uh, somewhere around uh, the 1140s, received a letter from an East European king, an East European Christian king named Prester John. And uh, it was a letter asking for help. Prester John ruled a Christian country somewhere in the Far East. And uh, that country was under threat by barbarians, possibly Tartars or possibly Mongols. And he wrote to the Byzantine Emperor for help and support. Now, the Byzantine Emperor simply put um, the letter away and did absolutely nothing about it. And it is, was thought that the kingdom of Prester John was overwhelmed. It became a fascinating story. All sorts of things were ascribed to it. They uh, ascribed uh, the fact that Prester John was in fact descended from one of the three Magi, uh, the wise men who had attended at Jesus' crib uh, in the biblical story. Yeah. Some people said that it was a wonderful land full of gold and silver and um, wonderful fountains and miraculous creatures. Now, whether or not Prester John existed, he became a sort of focus for the Christians of the, uh, for Christianity in the East. And as you quite rightly say, some people used it to raise their own standing and say, here uh, there are kings of the East, and we should have helped them when, when we got the chance. They're now overwhelmed. Some of them were supposedly Mongol, uh, the descendants of Prester John were supposedly Mongol princes. For instance, it was thought that when he was called King David of India, he was actually Tamajin, who became Genghis Khan and welded the um, eastern steppes together. Others said, of course, that uh, uh, Prester John may have um, ruled over a slightly different type of Christianity, a Christianity which was nearer Buddhism. And this is why the emperor um, did not uh, help them, because he knew they were Nestorian uh, Christians, which, as I say, was slightly closer to Buddhism than it was to the Christianity of the West. 
and there were Christians living there. Other people said that Prester John um, lived in Ethiopia, and this moved the, the notion of Prester John's kingdom from the east to North Africa. And it, it was thought that Haile Selassie was a descendant of Prester John. And um, depending on whom you speak to, some of the Rastafarians still believe that. So uh, there's all sorts of, uh, it's mixed with uh, Christianity, it's mixed with the Mongol Empire, and it's uh, mixed with um, Rastafarianism. Yeah, it's strange to see the permutations that Prester John takes on over the years as they try, right. try to use that, that story. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. You're listening to Banal of America Audio. I was sailing for two and a half weeks there in Due West and making nine knots. I should have been in Fiji in less than a week. Well, the first piece of land I saw was in Fiji, was it? No. No, it was here, this, this island. And you know what? Because of this, you see? This is all there is left. This ocean and this place here, we are stuck in a bloody snow globe. I was really surprised in the book that there are a lot of these lost lands, forgotten realms here in the United States. And the one I first wanted to ask you about was this uh, kingdom of Prince Madoc in Alabama, because you say of all the places in the book, that one seems to be the most possible to be real. I hope I got that right. You have indeed. And uh, to be perfectly honest, Tim, that's one of my favorites, because we're talking about a medieval Welsh kingdom from uh, from about the 12th century which existed in southern Alabama. And we do know that uh, uh, during uh, the middle of the 12th century, Wales uh, was in great turmoil. There was a kingdom which was known as Gwynedd, which is in South Wales, which was uh, incredibly uh, in upheaval uh, around uh, about 1137. That was because Owen Gwyneth, who was the king there, had so many sons. Um, the old Celtic chieftains had a considerable number of sons, and it was great to have so many sons. But whenever you died, it created all sorts of problems because the sons claimed your, uh, your kingship. Um, and there, we do know that one of the sons of Owen Gwyneth fled into the West to avoid the wars which were going on in his kingdom. And he was Prince Madoc. And it is thought that he sailed westwards and dropped anchor in Mobile Bay in southern Alabama. And that he uh, founded a kingdom there. He returned to Wales, it is said, uh, very briefly. Uh, we don't know whether he actually did return or not. And then took more people back with him and uh, settled. Now, the story which I like is that um, around about 1660, a Welsh missionary was captured by a branch of the Tuscarora Indians and was uh, about to be killed. He began to pray in Welsh and was answered in Welsh by one of the tribal elders who said that it was their sacred language and was uh, the language of Madog, who was a king among the ancient Indians. Now, Madog had come from Wales and settled in southern Alabama. And there, I think there is a river which uh, flows near the uh, Alabama River near Mobile, which is called the Mad Dog River, M-A-D, separate word, D-O-G. And that may well be a, a derivation of Madoc. Now, when the Spanish came uh, in the 1500s and came up the, the, the Mobile uh, or the Alabama River uh, north of Mobile, they found the ruins of ancient forts. Now, one of the forts uh, which they found actually matches, at, uh, to some extent, to a great extent, I should say, the layout of Carnarvon Castle in Wales. And it is possible that it was well, uh, built by Welsh stonemasons. So there may well have been a um, Welsh living in America long before Columbus, 300 years before Columbus arrived. Yeah, yeah. 
it's definitely one of the coolest ones in the book. And I like it. Really makes you think about yeah. some of these. Talk a little bit about the the search for El Dorado that that really uh, ruined the life of Coronado. <laughs> I think I forget his name. Uh, the, 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 the great Coronado, a uh, uh, governor of New Galicia. Coronado set out to find a great city. Now I don't know if you have seen a, a film uh, which um, is doing the rounds over here called National Treasure, starring the, uh, Nicholas Cage, mm-hmm. yeah. and and which they go in search of uh, El Dorado, which is somewhere beneath Mount Rushmore. Now uh, I can tell you that El, uh, El Dorado doesn't exist beneath Mount Rushmore, but whenever I was growing up, uh, El Dorado was supposed to exist somewhere in the, the Mato Grosso in the South American jungle. Now, I have to say, for a start, Tim, that El Dorado is not a city. It is a person, because huh. El Dorado means the gilded man, and possibly refers to ancient Aztec chieftains who smeared themselves in gold and threw themselves into a lake. But there were talk of um, cities somewhere in uh, America, and this is what Coronado set out to discover. He had been led by a a monk called Marco Steniza, who had heard various stories from shipwrecked sailors uh, of the seven cities of Cibola. Now, Cibola appears in the film simply as one city. There were actually seven cities. Mm -hmm. And uh, he set out to find them because one was made of gold and had been mined from the mountains. So he marched across from New Galicia, which is in northern Mexico, and he marched across the southern, southwestern United States. And he found nothing. His men were uh, devastated by disease and by desertions and by hunger and thirst. So whenever he crossed the Wichita River, he had been told that the cities actually existed on the other side of the Wichita River. And uh, he found nothing but a number of mud villages. And he turned back. But the myth of uh, seven cities, for instance, there was also a uh, myth that, uh, or a story that Romans in the final days of the Roman Empire had fled to America. Uh, it wasn't called America, but they had fled there, and they had established cities there. And uh, this was supposed to be part of the lost cities in America. So the, the story of... Um, the, the great cities continued to exist and were given a sort of fr- uh, fresh impetus when the French explorer Mahout stepped out of the jungles of Cambodia and into the main street of, uh, of a um, vastly overgrown city, which was uh, the Angkor Wat, which was the city of the Chimeres, which had been lost for about five or six hundred years. And so that fed into the national consciousness, and they said, well, if these cities are lying out in the Cambodian Vietnamese jungles, could they not also be lying out in the South American jungles? And so uh, the notion of El Dorado, the city of gold, uh, the gilded man, if you like, uh, was uh, was there, and, and drew explorers and all sorts of people uh, to try and discover where they were. And there were expeditions which were lost trying to find them. Yeah, it's a, I wouldn't want to be on one of these expeditions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would not. But, I mean, at this time, Tim, the South American jungle was still one of the great unexplored areas of the Earth. Yeah. And people were being drawn to the notion of wealth, to the ideal. And whenever I was growing up, the notion of El Dorado was that it was a futuristic city, which uh, somehow lay in the South American jungle. One story that I wanted you to talk about is uh, the search for the Fountain of Youth by Ponce de Leon. And I found it really interesting that it was less about a physical rejuvenation and redemption and more about a political uh, rejuvenation. Uh, Absolutely. Well, as I was saying, uh, a lot of the, the notions of searching for these places is actually more than a physical search. It's trying to find ideals. It's trying to find new perspectives. 
This actually ties in with the quest for immortality, which is a very, very old quest, um, which goes back actually into prehistoric times with the sons of Partholon. For instance, uh, there were people here in Ireland, um, Geraldus Cambrensius, uh, who was um, Gerald of Wales, who was a, a very learned monk, wrote that there was uh, a lake or a fountain in Ireland where uh, if a man washed his hair, be he white as snow, it would return to its natural color. Now, I have been looking for that, Tim, for many years and still haven't found it. <laughs> you obviously never heard of Greece in 2000. Um, and, of course, uh, you get the notion of healing and all from the water. And I mention in the book The Pool of Bethsaida in the Bible. The quest for immortality, the quest for healing, had always been a great quest. And Ponce de Leon had thought that the fountain itself might lie in a place called Bimini. Now, uh, Bimini was uh, is a couple of islands. There's Grand Bimini and Lesser Bimini. And uh, it was held by the Spanish uh, at a time. Uh, there's very little there now. But uh, it had originally been held by the Arawaks. And the Arawaks had a legend that there was a fountain which uh, a great chieftain had discovered and had, uh, was still living on the island because he had lived forever. Now, De Leon had been actually uh, one of the first uh, governors of Cuba, which is one of the territories which had been uh, ascribed uh, to Christopher Columbus. Now, Columbus's son, Diego, went to the court in Madrid and asked if all his lands, the lands that his father had claimed, could be returned to the family, and the court ruled in his favor which meant that de Leon, as governor, was out of a job. And so he tried to revive his fortunes by setting out on an expedition to find the Fountain of Youth following the old Arawak legends. He found nothing on Bimini, but he was driven uh, ashore and landed on the American coast. And he landed there on the Feast of Flowers, which was just before Easter. And he named the uh, area that he had landed on after the Feast of Flowers. He called it Florida. And he had thought that somewhere in the hinterland of Florida lay the Fountain of Youth. He didn't know about Disney World, but he set out to find uh, uh, the fountain, but he didn't find it. If he had found the Fountain of Youth, he, he claimed, uh, or he imagined, that his political fortunes would be restored. He had once been a very influential figure in the Caribbean, but now with uh, the, the rise of the Columbuses, uh, he found himself out of favor. So this was actually an attempt to restore his own political fortunes by basing it around a legend. Yeah. Now, there was rumors that Bimini itself had been the site of a great civilization. And uh, that may be the case because divers have found the remnants of a great causeway, which made uh, the great writer Edgar Cayce write that Bimini was uh, the center of this civilization and drew attention to the Bimini Road. Uh, which the divers had discovered. So we don't know. There may have been something there. There may not have been something there. But the Leon uh, tried to use the Fountain of Youth to regain his political fortune. However, he failed and died more or less in poverty. Yeah, it's a strange story, one you don't really hear about in the history books here in America. Well, you just hear that he was there you are. The youth. Yeah. Uh, uh, he, he gave you Florida. <laughs> I'm not sure if I should thank him or not. <laughs> There wasn't anything in the book here uh, about the Grand Canyon uh, as far as the lost city in there, and I thought I'd heard something about that. I was going to ask you if you had. Well, now, this follows a whole number of old legends. Now, there, there's supposed to be lost cities. All, uh, if you travel about the American Southwest, almost up into the mid area, you will find stories of lost cities. Most of these come from uh, Spanish incursions, uh, and it was what we were talking about earlier with the in the El Dorado, because they were supposed to be the cities of the seven patriarchs, which were, as I said, about um, people, um, some of them said they were Christians who fled from Rome to avoid persecutions, or emperors who are people connected to the, the Caesars who fled from Rome whenever the, the Ostrogoths and the Goths 
uh, sacral in uh, the the 500s and fled to America and set up cities. Uh, the, the, the Spaniards, of course, when they, they traveled, they saw great rock formations. It comes back to, once again, what we were talking about much earlier. Well, whenever you look out at the horizon and see massive rock formations and so on, uh, they begin to look like cities. There are areas in Montana, for example, like the Devil's Towers, yeah. stuff like that, which from a distance may look like the spires of a great city. And many of the early Spaniards, whenever they arrived in what was for them unknown and unfamiliar territory where anything could be lurking, um, they saw these things way in the distance and they ascribed them to lost cities and marked them on maps. In many cases, they didn't travel to them right away, but they marked them on maps so that others could follow them. Uh, of course, nothing was ever found. And the Grand Canyon is one, because the Grand Canyon is quite a spectacular place with all sorts of rocks and hidden bits and pieces to it. And uh, the, uh, the early explorers said, well, you know, there's probably something there. It's so bizarre, it's so awe-inspiring, it's so strange to us uh, that it's that there has to be something there. And so the legends grew up, and, there, and there's all sorts of legends of cities and all sorts of legends of strange peoples and, and all sorts of things which uh, came out of the early Spanish exploration. Now, I thought I had heard that they were doing some exploring or something in the Grand Canyon in the 1930s or something like that, and it was a National Geographic, and they had found something, but then it was never really mentioned again. Do you know anything about that? Well, no, there might well be, because there were very early Indians which were call, who were called mound dwellers, who began to build great things which were like sort of... Uh, and the only way I can describe it is primitive skyscrapers because mm -hmm. they went up and down. So that may be something. I, I'm not terribly familiar with that. Uh, I did hear, I like, a bit like yourself, Tim, I did hear something about it, but uh, that may be followed up in another book. Nice. Excellent. Good. Another of the stories I wanted to explore here with you was one that was described in great detail in the book and, and was really interesting, especially because it was just so detailed and, and the account of the story was so well well put together, and that's the Green Children. Indeed. Indeed. The Green Children uh, uh, were originally from St. Martin's Land, or so they claimed. Uh, the, now, we're beginning to move from uh, the upper lands of the earth to the subterranean world, uh, because uh, people look down into great holes and chasms and caves and said, I wonder if there's something down there as well. There were stories of, of lands under the, um, under the earth. But uh, the Green Children stands out among them because there seems to be some sort of connections and some sort of historical. Uh, they appeared in England in the 11th century at a time when England was in the throes of civil war between King Stephen and uh, the Empress Matilda. And they turned up at uh, the castle of a local knight. There was a boy and a girl. And they claim to have come from a land called St. Martin's Land, uh, which lay under uh, people's feet. The land of St. Martin's Land was not all that different from the land uh, which they found themselves in, except that the people had green skin. I mean, the people farmed, the people uh, lived in houses, they had cattle and pigs. But the boy and the girl were tending their father's sheep. And uh, they had heard the sound of a bell, and they had followed it, and they had climbed away up, uh, higher and higher, and they had come up through a hole, uh, which had been, uh, I think, created by a storm where a tree had been uh, uprooted. Mm -hmm. And they had come out, and they had been captured by... Uh, uh, by some people on the surface and taken to the castle of a local knight called Sir Richard de Colm. They spoke, it is said, in a high fluting language which was very unlike guttural uh, Middle English. They refused to eat any meat which was set before them because the people of St. Martin's Land were believed to be vegetarians. But they did get stuck into a, a massive basket of green beans. Now, the knight, Sir Richard, 
adopted them as his own and kept them in the castle. Uh, and uh, the girl thrived. The, uh, the girl seemed to get on tremendously well, although it is said in the old text that she was uh, a bit promiscuous. <laughs> uh, the the boy didn't. The boy became very moody and unmoped about after a while he died. He didn't like the upper. Uh, the girl actually married once they had stayed on the surface for a while. Uh, the green hue in uh, their skin began to decrease. But the girl actually married and uh, shortly after disappeared. And it said that she went back, I mean, she may have gone back to St. Martin's Land under uh, our feet. The thing is very detailed in, in a history of, of England. It is um, given as uh, occurring during the re- uh, either the reign of Stephen, who died in 1154, or during the reign of King Henry II, uh, 1154 to uh, 1189. Uh, it is thought that they came from a place called St. Mary by the Wolf Pits, which was a place uh, near the great cathedral at Bury in England. Uh, and that the hole that they had come up with and to which the girl is uh, supposed to have returned was in Thetford Forest. Now, we literally don't know uh, about, uh, about uh, whether or not she went back to um, an underground world. Um, there are some claim she did and some claim she didn't. What I found interesting was that in uh, roughly about 1887 in Spain, in, in a place called Banchos, two green children also appeared. And they had uh, come out of a large cave which had been uncovered. Uh, well, it had been recently sealed, but it had been pulled out again by a, a landslide. And they were dressed in long gown-like clothes of an unknown material and spoke in a strange fluting language. They both claimed to come from a place called San Martino, which is St. Martin's Land. So I have I find that very interesting. I mean, the, the green children in England, uh, there have been an, a whole number of... Um, explanations to it in which people have suggested that the green tinge was or was some sort of uh, sickness from which the children uh, suffered and that they uh, actually came from uh, the Suffolk village of Fornham St. Martins um, and had been caught up in the rebellion against King Stephen and had wandered under tin mines from which they had got this sort of hue uh, to their skins. But it doesn't actually explain what happened in, in Spain. I have found that a very, very interesting and a, and a very, very, as you say, very, very detailed. Yeah, yeah, and, and you actually beat me to the punch there on the on the Spanish story because that's yep. what I found really intriguing because if it was just the one-off story from the medieval yeah. times, you could kind of write it off, but then... Yep. The story reemerges in a new setting, and 700 years later, it's a little too coincidental. I don't know what to make of it. That is indeed. Now, what about, uh, there's a location here that that I wanted to ask you about that's not in the book. It's less of a lost land than, I guess you could say, uh, an infamous location. Uh, And that would be the Alexandrian Library. Do you know much about that area? The Alexandrian Library. I was supposed to be a great library. When in, uh, it was um, a great library in the, the um, what is now the Liberian, uh, or not, uh, the Libyan, sorry, sorry, the Libyan, um, uh, capital of Alexandria. And it was supposed to be a great library. Uh, Alexandria was a port, and people traveled to it because it was a major city. And uh, great scholars, great philosophers. Now, there was a library there which uh, had a, a very unique lending policy. You could only get access to the scrolls, because there were no books there. It was all scrolls and, uh, and things like that. If you brought something of your own uh, and uh, deposited it in the library... And so the library became uh, a great repository of knowledge, but it was uh, on the African coast, and uh, it was continually being sacked in ver- uh, the, because the city was such an important and such a wealthy city, it was continually being sacked by raiders. And so the great library at Alexandria was destroyed. 
And I have no doubt that the library did exist. And all that wealth, all the wealth of ages, uh, because the library continued for uh, quite a considerable time, is now lost to us, which is a great, great shame. Yeah, it's a heartbreaking story and one that mm. is... Uh that you don't hear too much about nowadays. You, you, you don't, mainly because uh, Libya is not a, a, a sort of politically correct country at the moment uh, under Colonel Gaddafi. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Let me see. There's only one other uh, story I wanted you to tell okay. here. The Shepherd of the Hills. Oh, the Shepherd of the Hills in North Carolina. Yeah, this was a fascinating story and one that uh, resonates because it's rather contemporary and, you know, in relation to a lot of the other stories, has a lot of detail to it and uh, raises a lot of interesting questions because this is such a vanishing aspect to it. I should point out that North Carolina has always interested me because there are supposedly uh, what are called, uh, well, there are what are called bolds. Uh, these are places uh, where no grass will grow. Near the town of Raleigh, there is a place called the Devil's Tramping Ground, and I make reference to places like Whiteside Mountain uh, and the Devil's Courthouse. These are all associated with uh, the enemy of mankind. But uh, the Reverend Hawkins um, w was a well-known minister and, uh, and a well-known figure in North Carolina, uh, in the Sapphire Hills. Uh, and uh, he was living with his um, son-in-law, the Reverend W.D. Uh, at that time he was 73. He was a retired Methodist minister. We're talking about a time in the 1930s. And uh, he went out into um, uh, it's on the North Carolina, South Carolina border. Tom Hawkins was known as the Shepherd of the Hills, and he set out uh, to try and find uh, a lost uh, steer, which had wandered uh, up into the hills, which belonged to his son-in-law. Uh, it was a blustery night, and the son-in-law had just come in, and the, the, the steer was gone. And he said, look, I'll go out and try and find that. And they went out, and he disappeared. Now, there are allegedly stories that, a bit like the balls, nothing will grow on these, but uh, they are supposedly um, entrances to another world which lies beneath us. And it was thought that Tom Hawkins was carried away by people who came up from the uh, from down below and had a scout about and he stumbled across them and they took him back underground with them. Now that's a contemporary story and, and, and it's an old uh, it has all the qualities of an old folk tale but nobody has ever been able to explain and this is in the 1930s which as you quite rightly say is a relatively modern thing. Uh, no one has ever been able to explain what happened to Tom Hawkins. He may be, uh, and they found queer, queer uh, marks on the ground where he, as if he had been dragged uh, along. So one never knows, whenever you go up into the North Carolina, South Carolina border country, be very careful because uh, there's goblin lights on the ridges and strange fires burning in the hollows. Yeah, it's strange. Um, what about any uh, mysterious locations here in Massachusetts that I should be worried about? Anything I should be concerned oh, about? There are, there, are, <laughs> there, are, there are supposed to be entrances to uh, uh, other worlds in um, Massachusetts, particularly uh, in the Salem area. Really? Which was at the time of the witches. There was supposed to be uh, all sorts of um, things come out of Round Hills. Remember that Round Massachusetts and, uh, and there was where H.P. Lovecraft said some of his stories about things from the other world coming up and carrying off people. So don't go swimming around uh, Ipswich or anything like that. <laughs> I'll try not. I'm, a, I'm not much of a swimmer as it is, so I think we'll, we'll be okay. Well, I can't swim at all. So. <laughs> well, talk a little bit about these illustrations in the book uh, that, that are done by Ian Daniels. They're all, they're amazing too. They're they're fantastic drawings and really captivating stuff. The idea for the book came to me, Tim, and I have to be quite honest, standing at my sink. <laughs> because, because uh, in my kitchen, because uh, where I stand uh, in my kitchen, I am looking over the river ban into the oldest continuously inhabited place in Ireland. 
which uh, dates back to 7000 BC. Ian and I have known each other for uh, quite some time. Ian lives in Midstone in Kent. And I rang Ian and I said, look, I've got this idea. Well, he says, if we can do it, he says, I'll illustrate it for you. And uh, we corresponded, uh, we talked, and we corresponded by email. And uh, he kept sending me down stuff, and I kept saying, Ian, that's magnificent. We'll, we'll go with that. So I kept sending him the text. He kept sending me back stuff, and that was how the illustrations came about. Uh, what you don't see, Tim, in the book is the colour, uh, because he sent me down the illustrations in colour, and the colours are staggering. I'm trying to persuade New Page to do a colour version of this. That would be cool. I'd like to see uh, that. Uh, I would. And, uh, and I'm looking here um, at some of uh, your other books. Talk a little bit just uh, about some of these other books you've written, because you have quite a... Quite a bibliography of stuff. Oh, I have. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you some of the other stuff I've done for Career. Uh, the, uh, the, the Career contacted me at one point and said, how would you like to do a thing on vampires? Uh, now, the, uh, and, and in actual fact, I'm doing a thing now for Career on the Walking Dead. But we did a thing on vampires, and we began to look at uh, vampires uh, around the world. And uh, everybody thinks uh, that vampires are either a bit like uh, Christopher Lee with the great cloak and, and the burning eyes, or else like something out of Buffy. <laughs> um, and vampires appear in every culture. I mean, you have a Vietnamese vampire who is nothing more than a floating head and who drinks through extended antennae which come out of its nose. You have uh, things in the Philippines called Aswang who drink through their tongue. My favorite, of course, is the Albanian Sampiro. Albanian Sampiro is uh, actually a, a dead a person of Turkish descent because the Turks and the Albanians don't get on tremendously well. Uh, and, uh, and there's a lot of xenophobia and, uh, and, and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, this walks about wrapped in a shroud on high heels uh, with large eyes making kissing noises. I think I may have seen one of those down the town not so long ago. <laughs> Uh, you wouldn't get them in Massachusetts. Oh, well, I'm, I'm afraid they're, they're <laughs> probably everywhere. <at> this <laughs> there are. The other thing which I've done is the Encyclopedia of the Undead, which looks at uh, a number of things like werewolves and uh, and zombies. I mean, I'm, I'm actually writing on voodoo at the minute, so I'll maybe come back at some stage and talk to you about voodoo and about the undead and about vampires and about everything. Absolutely. I would love that. I would love no that. problem, Tim. And have you looked much at the uh, the whole Hall of Earth? Because that's kind of a lost yes. land thing. That was uh, that was what we began to look at in Lost Lands, because um, there are, for those of you, uh, the, uh, your your listeners who are not familiar with the theory, there is a theory that um, the Earth is not in fact solid; it is actually hollow. I mean, that was also part of a Nazi philosophy, and that it can be accessed the interior world can be accessed at both the North and South Poles. There were also expeditions uh, by the Nazis to find uh, some sort of polar route because it was also said that what uh, in the 1950s and, and 60s that some of what we call today flying saucers do not uh, originate from other planets but from a civilization within the Hollow Earth. And there's a lot of stories about interior lands down in the center of the world. As I was saying earlier, probably men looked into the deep, dark holes and chasms and whatever of the world and said, I wonder what's down there. And you get stories uh, in the 1960s. The, the big, uh, the big films were things like Doug McClure. You wouldn't even be far too young to remember Doug McClure. Um, and Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth, where he had a big boring machine and went down and discovered the sentence of uh, of ancient civilizations uh, living under the earth. Uh, and I suppose there is still a fear that perhaps down in the dark beneath us, 
there's something lurking that's coming up that might come up and savage us. So whenever you go around uh, Massachusetts and all, be very careful. Well, I try to. I try to stay out of trouble, but <laughs> trouble finds Good me. Good man. Just a, just a side note. Have you ever seen the program Lost? It's sort of uh, kind of right in this wheelhouse of Lost Lands Forgotten Realms. It, it is, but it's a program. I've written about vampires, but I have actually, Tim, never watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, I tell a lie. I watched one and turned it off halfway through. I haven't. I haven't watched Lost. Uh, I did try to get into it at one stage, but I found it so complex uh, because you needed to know what was going on, and there was so many surreal turns and stuff that yeah. were. Uh, that uh, I didn't know. But uh, I'll give it another go on your recommendation, Tim. Oh, totally, definitely. And, uh, yeah. it's, well, it's, it was amusing because when I was reading the book, uh, so many of these locations have been offered by viewers of the show and Absolutely. trying to figure it out. You know, they think Absolutely. it's Lemuria or they think Absolutely. it's Atlantis, and it's yeah. like, it's pretty cool that uh, well, there you the are. connection. There you are. Maybe they'll hire me as a scriptwriter. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. So now you kind of teased you're doing, uh, you're doing a, I think you said, an undead book coming out. Oh, yes. Uh, what's we, we have. Now, this is for Career Press. Uh, once again, on, on new page, who are the publishers of Lost Lands Forgotten Realms, so I'd better give them a plug. We're doing Walking with the Walking Dead, and we're beginning to look at uh, notions of resurrection, uh, notions of people coming back from the grave and, uh, and how that has come into our culture. Uh, we're looking at uh, things like zombies, we're looking at mummies, we're looking at the gothic heritage and stuff like and the Muravio, which is the Celtic walking dead uh, and the living mummies of Japan. So we're looking at all that and uh, that book should be out in the fall, I think. Um, I'm, I'm doing a whole series of things, uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't be talking about it. I'm, uh, I, I have a new book of folk tales coming out. I've, uh, I have a new book about Ireland, about witches and ghosts in Ireland, which is uh, I've just got the stuff this morning, and uh, it's uh, being brought out by Barnes and Noble. So we're, we're working at all sorts of things, Tim. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, now that I've read this first book here, uh, my first book from you that I've read, Lost Lands, Forgotten Realms, I'm going to be uh, looking into your catalog and digging into your bibliography well, because I'm, I was so impressed with this book. I can't wait to see what, what else you Well, got. have a look. Uh, you can find a lot of the stuff I do on Amazon. And you don't have a website or anything? I am talking about putting up a website. At the minute, Tim, I'm... I'm writing, I'm teaching, I'm setting up community um, uh, development here and in Japan and places like that. And I'm trying to get around to developing a website because it's the way we do business nowadays and uh, possibly by the end of the year. I hope so. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Is there a way for people to get in touch with you? Yep. You, you want that sort of thing? <laughs> well, look, uh, I, I, I'd give them an email address because that's always the best way to get in contact with me. I'm here. Here, there, and everywhere. The uh, email is, uh, and this is all one word, and it's all lowercase. And uh, if they don't get it, I mean, they, you have it as well. Yeah. It's D R B O B C U R R A N at yahoo.co.uk. There you go. Perfect. There you go. Um, and, uh, they can drop me a line. Where can people pick up the book? All, uh, they can get it at all good booksellers. Uh, I mean, uh, they're selling it all across America. And they can get it on Amazon. Excellent. Yes, definitely. If they don't have it at the bookstore, request it or go home and get on the computer and order it from Amazon. This Absolutely. is a must-read book. I'm telling you, folks, you got to pick it up. Lost Lands, Forgotten Realms. It's outstanding. I can't put it over enough. I enjoyed it so much. As soon as I started reading it, it was just like you, c you can't put it down. Uh, it's it's amazingly well written. It's It's tremendously researched. People who who know about the esoteric have heard about so many of these places, like Atlantis and Lemuria and Davy Jones Locker, Shangri-La, and you only sort of kind of hear about them, and this book really fleshes them out, that you really learn so much more about these locations and, and, and really uh, their origins and their evolution over time. So I, I can't commend you enough for putting together such a tremendous book, and I can't thank you enough here for coming on the show and uh, all the way from Northern Ireland, I know it's the evening there. It's uh, it's only the afternoon here, so I'm doing okay. <laughs> but, You're okay. It's, uh, it's half it. 
uh, at night here. Like I said, Bob, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. And, and it and was a pleasure. And, uh, and it was lovely to talk to you and lovely to talk to your listeners. That does it for this week's edition of BOA Audio Season 3. Big, big, super huge thanks to Dr. Bob Curran for coming on the show. As I said numerous times in the interview, I highly recommend his book, Lost Lands, Forgotten Realms. It is a definite must-read for any serious student of the world of esoterica. It really gives you a chance to find out much more information about a lot of these esoteric locations that have previously really only existed in the shadows and rumor mills of esoterica. Of course, you can reach him at the following email address, drbobcurran at yahoo.co.uk. Moving right along now, it's time for BOA Audio listener feedback. And this week's letter comes from Johnny Wishoff. That's his name, my friends, Johnny Wishoff. And here's what he has to say. Hey, and thanks for a great sight. My name is Johnny Wishoff. I'm a musician and have a project in the psi field of trance. In psi trance and psychedelic, speeches and quotes from people are often used, and I found your shows very inspiring. So I couldn't resist using some of it on my new tracks for this project. Are you open to letting me use your stuff? All material used is pro-BOA, though I've edited a bit, the meaning is the same, or even stronger. Hope you guys are cool with it, and keep up the fantastic work. Best wishes, Johnny Wishoff. You'll be happy to know that I wrote Johnny back and let him know that of course he could use some clips from BOA in his musical projects, as long as he uh, let us know what was going on with that, kept us updated on it, and... Hopefully we'll have something cool here to play for you at BOA in the not-too-distant future. Some psi trance music with BOA mixed in, courtesy of Johnny Wishoff. I wish him the best of luck with his project and look forward to seeing what he's come up with, mixing some BOA in with some psychedelic music. If you'd like to be a part of BOA Audio listener feedback, there's a couple ways to do it. Either write to boaaudio at hotmail.com or simply go to banalofamerica.com and click the contact button. Either one of those methods puts your correspondence in the inbox for BOA Audio listener feedback. Up next, it is the thanks portion of the show. We are very close to getting BOA Audio after hours up and running, and soon you'll be hearing from these folks, but until then, let me just give them the thanks. Of course, I'm talking about the outstanding BOA staff. Leslie, Chiron, R. Lee, Joe V., Tina Senna, and Rochelle Hawks. This crew is top-notch. They are awesome. They definitely carry the load at BOA Mondays through Fridays with their columns. If there's breaking news in the world of Esoterica, chances are one of the BOA staff, or more of them, will be covering it. Like we say week in and week out here, folks, I'm kind of repeating myself, but it's definitely worth driving the point home every week. If you're only listening to BOA Audio and you're not reading the columns at Ben of America, you're only getting half the story. Check out BOA and find out why so many are making it a part of their everyday search for esoteric news and opinion. This week you heard a lengthy phone conversation with Northern Ireland, much like the episode a couple of weeks ago with Christo Lowe. As you can surmise, I'm sure, I had to foot the bill for that hour and a half long phone call to Northern Ireland, much like I had to foot the bill for the two-hour call to South Africa. These bills add up, my friends, and so here at the end of the program we turn to you and ask you to make a donation to BOA to help us offset the costs of these lengthy international phone calls and, of course, the hosting and the bandwidth and all the other associated costs that come along with a program like this. How can you donate? Simple. You go to Benal of America, you click the PayPal button, and you make a donation. You can find the PayPal button on the main page or on the BOA Audio archive page. Click that, it'll take you to PayPal, make a donation. No donation is too small, and all donations go towards keeping BOA Audio and Ben All of America up and running and freely available for all of our great listeners and readers the world over. Next week on the program, we're going back to the world of ghosts with an A-list name from the ghost genre, Jeff Belanger, creator of the online juggernaut Ghost Village. We're going to be covering a number of gems from his latest book, Ghost Files, including the various theories on what ghosts are, the commercialization of haunted locations, Jewish exorcisms, Jeff's global travels investigating haunted places, dealing with skeptics, the evolution of orbs, 
and other fun stuff. We're also going to examine big picture issues from a number of different angles. We're going to cover the explosion in popularity for ghost hunting and esoterica on the internet. Jeff has tremendous first-hand observations and experience on both of these big picture issues and we're going to, as I said, cover them from a number of angles. It's going to be a fun, loose, and at times frank discussion with a researcher who's at the very top of the wildly popular field that is ghost research. Jeff Belanger, creator of Ghost Village and author of Ghost Files, next week on BOA Audio Season 3. And on that note, we're going to wrap it up for the week. Until you hear from me next time, folks, this is Tim Banal, thanking you for listening and signing off.